Oops. Let me pull out my blending modes lecture real quick. Okay, so pretty short lecture, and then we're going to jump right into we're going to jump right into a tutorial. Okay, so blending modes. What is a blending mode? Well, you will learn after the lecture um, that it's certainly much easier explained, actually demonstrating it live, than it is actually trying to describe what a blending mode is, but. Uh, Essentially, it is similar to the opacity slider, slider in the layers panel. Remember last class when uh, we talked about if, a, if an adjustment layer was too extreme or if, it was, uh, if the adjustment was too much that you could use the opacity slider to kind of dumb down the, the effects of that adjustment. Well, blending mode similar to that in that nature um, is the idea of overlaying two objects in Photoshop and, give, and getting a different effect, okay? So we're gonna talk about blending modes today in its simplest form. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down into the easiest way to actually understand it. Uh, it will, um, which is actually not even close to the way that you'll ever use it when you're actually using Photoshop. But we'll break it down into its simplest form and then we'll actually break it down into uh, actually actually introducing blending modes to actual photographs and seeing what it is that they do. Um, but essentially we're going to look at how uh, what happens when uh, you overlay certain images over each other. So this will become more apparent. We'll actually use them uh, a lot more not just in the aspect of photography but we'll use it a lot once we actually start collaging images and doing renderings later on in the semester. But we'll look at it in its kind of basic form today. Okay, so similar to the opacity slider in a layers panel, which allows you to blend the active layer with the layers of the layers beyond by making the active layer translucent. So, what exactly that does that mean? So, let's say that you have um, an architectural drawing. Okay, let's say you have an architectural drawing, and then you put a piece of trace paper over that drawing. Okay, well, you put that piece of trace paper over it to start to sketch or start to modify your original drawing. Well. Essentially, once you put that trace paper on it, along with all of the additions that you've put on the trace paper, you essentially have something different than what you started with. You, you no longer have what the original print was. So that's kind of like what blending mode uh, does inside Photoshop. So when you actually lay something over, um, you're going to uh, apply the blending mode, which actually is a mathematical calculation um, similar to a lot of the presets that we looked at when we were doing uh, some of our adjustment layers, uh, blending modes uh, is a system of mathematical presets established inside Photoshop that have certain effects on your photo. Okay, I get it's probably still a little fuzzy. It's still not quite making sense uh, all the way, but it's gonna it's gonna get a little bit better. So blending modes continue. Blending modes is broken down into uh, a variety of different groups, all of which have different effects on your photographs, okay? You'll notice that this little toolbar that you see on the right, which is actually the toolbar from Photoshop, okay? So this is exactly what you'll see once you open up Photoshop, is broken down into a variety of different groups, okay? Uh, the first two blending modes, these are going to be your normal Blending modes, these are going to be what your image is in by default. Once you open it up, it will be in normal. Then you're going to have five or so, five, four, six, uh, kind of a variety of different numbers of other different subcategories of blending modes. Some will uh, focus strictly on improving the darks inside of an image, things like shadows, okay? So you'll have a great emphasis on, uh, on your shadows and the darker portions of your image when applying a darken blending mode to your image, okay? Uh, and then below that would be the opposite, where you'll get uh, an emphasis on the lights in your image, okay? So if you have an image that maybe has poor lights in your uh, maybe really good darks, you might apply a lightning blending mode to where it's going to have uh, a very positive effect on the lighter portions of the image and uh, little to no effect on the darken. Now contrast, 
is a little bit uh, is a little bit of uh, the best of both worlds. Okay, so it's going to have uh, actually very little effect on uh, both the lights and the darks. It will have some effect, but it's going to have a great emphasis towards kind of the grays and the midtones of your image. So if you have an image that maybe is lacking a little, uh, maybe the uh, the shadows are a little dull. Maybe the sky is a little washed out. Uh, and your overall your colors are a little kind of uh, monotone a little bit um, the contrast blending modes are a really good option okay uh, and then we have a few other categories uh, like uh, inversion cancellation and component we're not going to focus so much uh, on those today we will actually look at luminosity as one of our as one of the blending modes that will finish off during the uh, during the tutorial okay uh, today we're going to focus mostly uh, on multiply. We're going to look at lighten and screen, overlay, soft light uh, a little bit later, uh, and luminosity. We're not going to go through every one of them. Uh, just like the presets that we learned uh, last class, they all kind of work the same where um, you know, darken, multiply, color burn, they will all have a great emphasis on the dark colors. Uh, but ultimately you'll have to kind of uh, experiment with them a little bit so that you understand what it is uh, that they do. Um, there's not really a clear answer. If you actually Google uh, what the different blending modes do, it's going to give you like a mathematical formula of, of how they actually affect your photograph. Well, you can't actually compute that formula in your head and kind of get a result. So uh, it, it'll be good to kind of play with those a little bit today when, when we are uh, working on the homework assignment. Okay. Uh, so moving on. So as I mentioned, we're going to look at multiply screen, overlay, uh, soft light, and then also uh, luminosity. So these are the most commonly used blending modes that you'll typically use. Okay. I found by using them uh, quite a bit that by far these are the ones that I use the most and that tend to work for my imagery uh, when I'm working. So uh, the next few slides are going to be an illustration, kind of breaking down uh, blending modes in its simplest form. Okay, so here we have two layers. Okay, we have a background layer, which might be the image that you're going to open up initially inside Photoshop, and then you also have another layer that's inside the foreground, that's in the foreground. Okay, so it's in front of the blue layer. Okay, and if you guys actually, uh, I'm going to go over to canvas really quickly. If you go over to your assignments and you go over to assignment five blending modes, I actually uploaded a, oh, I thought I did. Oh, let me fix that in just a second. But if you go over to files and then go over to support files, there's going to be a sample blending modes document. Okay. So you can actually do, uh, I'm going to open this up in Photoshop in about five minutes, but you can actually kind of do it as I do it so you can get an understanding of it. But uh, before I do that, let's just kind of go through the slides a little bit. Uh, let's see, full screen. Okay, so we have a background layer and we have a foreground layer, okay? Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to apply a blending mode to the layer that is in the foreground, okay? So it's going to be our uppermost layer on our image, okay? So you're never going to put a layer of three different colors like this on any of your slides, but this will help you get an understanding of what each of these do. So in this foreground layer, we have a black square, a gray square, a gray square, a white square, and a gradient. Okay, the gradient going from black to white. Okay, so we're going to put that on top of the blue layer. Okay, so once you open up this file, this is what it will look like. Okay, it's going to look like uh, it's going to have these two layers along with two other layers that we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, later on. So what you see here, there is actually no blending mode applied whatsoever, okay, to the foreground layer. Okay, so the first example is when we apply the multiply uh, blending mode to uh, the layer on the foreground. So what happens when you apply the multiply blending mode? Oh, well, what happens is our whites in our images become trans uh, become transparent, uh, and our darks in our image become even darker. Okay, so what's actually happening here is the blending mode is actually having an effect on the image in the background. So notice that our white square is now transparent, so you can't see it anymore. 
our gray square has made the blue background uh, darker, but not uh, not black. And the black square is still black. Okay. So the the big effect of a multiply blending mode is that your whites will become transparent, and you'll have a much greater emphasis on the darks in your in your image. Okay. And you're gonna get a little bit of an idea looking here at the gradient on how that might work. Okay, so let's see what would happen if we apply the screen layer. The screen layer is going to have the opposite effect, okay? Where you can see here on the left-hand side, the black square that we, that we had in our foreground layer uh, makes, makes, the, uh, makes the background layer a little, bit, uh, a little bit lighter. And as you move up in the spectrum, our gray is gonna become uh, a little wider and our white will just become pure white, okay? And you can see that reverse, you can see that reverse happening over down here bottom in our gradient. Okay, so essentially these two, uh, these two, these two uh, blending modes are going to have opposite effects on each other. Okay, so moving on, next we have the overlay. Okay, and notice that the overlay is kind of a little bit of the best of all the worlds. Okay, we are getting a nice effect on the on the dark shades, okay? So our black has now become a nice, rich, dark blue. The gray has become uh, a slightly lighter blue, and our white has become not all the way pure white, but has uh, softened uh, significantly, okay? So we're kind of getting a nice rounded out uh, variation of the first two blending modes that we looked at, okay? So that's gonna be it for that, for that little lecture. Let's actually open this up inside Photoshop and then we can, uh, we're gonna go through that exact demonstration ourselves and then we'll actually demonstrate it with some actual photographs, okay? So let's open up Photoshop real quick. Okay, so See, what did I say last class? Every time I open up Photoshop, these same images pop up every single time. Even though I close them. Yeah, I know, but I close them every single time. I say no, I say no. I don't want to save it. Okay, so here's our sample blending mode document. This is what we were seeing in that lecture tutorial. Has everyone got this? Or for those that have opened it, is it are you getting the right thing? You should have four layers. You should have a background layer that is blue. You should have layer one, which is going to be our different squares and our gradient. And then you have two layers above, which is an actual, which are actual images, okay? Everybody see, everybody got that? I, I, so, I, I went to account. So go out. to, uh, let's see, you are not in the right class. Oh. Yeah, go to your course. What if I drive real quick? download that. Okay, so you have layer one, which is going to be your colored tiles, all right, and your gradient. Layer two, uh, if I turn it on, you'll notice that it's a black and white line drawing. And layer three, if I turn it on, is going to be the reverse of the original drawing. Okay, so let's click on layer one. Layer one is going to be the layer that's in our foreground. And let's apply our first blending mode to that. If you move your mouse or your cursor up to this little uh, this little toolbar that says normal, that's where you're going to get all of your different blending modes, okay? And depending on what um, what version of Photoshop you're using, I think if you're using CC, the newest version of CC, you might even have a couple new ones, okay? So if you do, kudos to you. Uh, but uh, this is going to be what you have on this computer. So the first blending mode that we're gonna look at is multiply. So if we click on multiply, you'll notice that our whites become white and our dark becomes even darker. So an example of how I might use this uh, in the future is uh, let's say I wanted to, uh, I took an image, maybe a rendering that I created and I wanted to put uh, a tree in it. Well, uh, you have a couple options. You could select all of the white background of the tree and you could very carefully get rid of that so that you place your tree uh, really nicely into your 
uh, into your image, but you can also apply a multiply blend, uh, blending mode to that where all of your whites will become completely transparent. So uh, depending on how you use it, it can become uh, a very strategic and quick uh, way to uh, get rid of a background of, of an image, okay? Um, when I, my normal, it won't go over here. You gotta so highlight the right? level. Yeah, so click on level one and that will activate that layer. Okay, well that will allow you to apply a blending mode to that layer, okay? So we clicked on multiply, we applied the multiply blending mode to that layer one, okay? Let's try the same thing with the uh, screen. So if we click on screen, notice that we have a reverse, uh, reverse action of that. So we have our dark has gone uh, very light, okay? And our white has become extremely white, okay? And then I'm just gonna quickly, uh, we'll click on the, the last one, which is overlay. And like we saw in the demonstration earlier, you'll notice that we have um, a nice dark royal blue. We have a nice, very soft, uh, I'm sorry, I guess, I guess the first one would be navy blue. The next one would be royal blue. And the next one is kind of a nice baby blue, all right? So let's actually look at this on how this might affect an actual image, okay? So let's turn off layer one and let's turn on layer two. So if I apply a multiply blending mode to this, what do we think would happen? Anybody, any guesses? The screen go dark. I'm sorry? Would the screen go dark? So what color would the whites, the white on the image turn to? If whites become transparent, what might happen? And just go back to the background layer. Right, so it's gonna to go to your background layer. So whatever is behind it is what you're going to see. Okay, so I'll apply that multiply layer to that. And notice that we have almost kind of like an old fashioned blueprint, okay? Uh, and we'll actually get even a better example of that here in, uh, in just a few seconds. So going back to normal, if I apply a, a screen blending mode to that, what might that happen? So keep in mind that a screen blending mode will have the opposite effect of what we just did. Okay, any ideas? Yeah, so our blacks become transparent and our whites actually remain stationary, okay? So notice that on this one, there was actually very little effect, okay? So this is not really a desired outcome. So I'll show you examples of uh, of where a blending mode was very successful and sometimes they won't be. Not every blending mode uh, works well for every image, okay? So this actually le led me to a question that was actually asked uh, after almost everybody um, had left um, last class was uh, somebody asked, how do you know when you're done with an image, okay? Um, and that was actually a great question and, and there's really not an answer to that. Um, so what I told him was uh, every time you start to make adjustments to your, to your image, always start by asking yourself a question is what is wrong with the photograph, okay? I know it's really easy to just, you know, you get a photograph and you start to, you know, make some of the colors pop and you're like, okay, that looks good. But the first thing that you should always do is establish a problem, okay? Is uh, the exposure too high in the image? Is uh, are the shadows really dull and you know not allowing the image to pop? Are the you know are the colors really soft? And you know so you, you, hopefully you're understanding what I'm saying is that you should always propose yourself a problem with the image. What are you trying to fix? Because in your uh, for your assignment one, a part of assignment one is I'm going to ask you uh, to write a small paragraph on the adjustments that you chose to made, and I want to know why you chose to make them. Not just, oh, I applied, I applied the overlay blending mode and then I applied these two adjustments and I like the way that it looks. That's not what we're necessarily after. I want there to be a rhyme and a reason to why you're making the decisions that you're making. So, uh, but ultimately, there's not really an answer to that question is you don't always necessarily know when you're done. But if you could answer the question that you originally asked yourself, that will help you determine when you're done, okay? Uh, when you look at the image after you've applied the adjustments, are you, does the image look the way that you originally anticipated it? Okay, so that's kind of, that's, I think that's kind of a, a nice broad answer that I hope will 
help you guys when you are making these adjustments, that your goal is to not just pick a couple adjustment layers and uh, see how it looks. You should have an understanding of what each of them do and actually choose those adjustment layers based off of what you're trying to produce. Okay, so uh, moving back to our, our blending modes, you can see that by applying the screen blending mode to this particular example, that it actually has very little effect, okay? It's not, it's not doing hardly anything. So if we go back to normal and we apply the overlay, what might we get? Okay, based off of the first demonstration that we did, if I apply the overlay blending mode to this, what might we get? And knowing these answers is a part of the, you know, the process of consciously making the decision to choose one of these things. So I want, this will help you understand, uh, this, this will help you say, oh yeah, this actually, this blending mode could help me get to my, my end result. So what might we get when we use the blending or the overlay blending mode? What might happen to the white? Remember that we're going to get a little bit of the best of both worlds. So we're going to get kind of, uh, we're going to get results from kind of both of the previous two. Yeah, let's see. Let's take a look. Exactly. So we have a nice lighter, nice royal blue. Okay. If we turn off this layer, you can see that we started with this really dark blue. And now the white is a nice light blue. And the lines are a even though they look black on the screen, if you looked really, really closely, the lines are, you know, a really dark blue. Okay. So let's turn off layer two and let's turn on, actually turn that back to normal. Let's turn on layer three. Okay. So clicking on layer three and if I apply a multiply blending mode, what might happen? the whites will turn blue. So I'm guessing hardly anything is gonna to happen to this image, okay? You can see here that it did have somewhat of a very tiny effect on the projector, you can't really see it. But uh, on my screen, you can actually see all the line work turn to a nice royal blue, okay? But that's not usually the effect that we're going for, okay? So if I go back to normal and I add a screen blending mode, what do you think the effect would be? So the black is going to, what's going to happen to the black? Blue. Yeah, it's going to turn blue. Okay, so you're actually going to get what would actually look like an actual old blueprint. Okay, so this is actually what, you know, an old blueprint would look like. You have the nice blue paper and uh, the white line work. I actually picked up some old blueprints the other day. It was actually really interesting. I've looked at them a long time ago, but I had to get some archive drawings for the city of Wana Creek, and sure enough, blueprints. <laughs> blueprints. So that's going to be the effect of the screen blending mode. And lastly, let's look at overlay. And we're going to get uh, our blue is going to become very dark. Okay, it's going to become a really dark navy blue. And our whites are going to turn to that nice soft blue. Okay, so let's transition to that into actual photographs. Okay, so not using these, you know, very dumbed down basic examples. Okay, so let's close down this file. In the first portion of your exercise, if we go back to Canvas and we click on exercise five, what you're gonna have to do for exercise five is you're gonna have to create a total of 10 images, okay? Actually, you're creating five images. You're gonna have five originals and you're gonna have uh, five examples of each of the blending modes that we're gonna talk about. So your goal is to find an image uh, where the blending mode has a very positive effect on it, okay? Don't just pick a, any random image from your photographs that you have and just apply the blending mode to it. Actually consciously think which one would be a, a good, ex, you know, a good uh, example to use for that particular blending mode. So for the first one, to be able to clearly kind of illustrate this, what I'd like you to do, and you may already have a photo like this yourself, but if you go to Creative Commons, we talked about what this place is earlier on in the semester. Okay, so I'm gonna search the Creative Commons and I'm gonna look for a really old image, okay? I'm gonna look for a nice grainy old image if it ever wants to open that. Okay, so my internet doesn't wanna work, but luckily I have a bunch of old grainy images already on my thumb drive. So instead of searching on Creative Commons, you guys may wanna do that assuming your internet's working. Uh, but let's look at 
a couple examples. Okay, so I'm gonna open up this first image in Photoshop and what it is is an old image of actually a postcard. This is a postcard that has an old image of a train as a sepia photograph, okay? Well, part of the problems with old sepia photographs is that they tend to have really dull uh, shadows, okay? They're, I mean, actually in this, in this example, they're not, they're not too bad, but uh, let's look, take a look at how some of these blending modes might uh, affect us, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, last class we talked about duplicating the original layer, okay? So for the first four examples, I'm going to use just the image that we have, okay? I'm not gonna actually overlay two separate images until our last example, okay? Uh, but for this one, we're actually just gonna duplicate the first layer. So you're gonna notice that it says background and there's a lock, all right? If you right click on that, you can click on the button that says layer from background. That's gonna create a duplicate layer from the background layer, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and call this multiply. Okay, so just keeping our layers nice and organized. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit OK. Whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Let's see, uh, duplicate layer. All right, so now we have, uh, you can still click on the background layer and you can still click on layer from background. That allows it to be an adjustable or an, an editable layer. When it's locked like that and it's not rasterized, you won't be able to make any adjustments to it. So you can either click on layer from background or if you import it, you can also right click and click on rasterize layer and they'll do the same thing. So, but the effect is that, that I'm looking for is two duplicate layers, all right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna work on the uppermost layer, the one that's on the foreground, all right? And let's go ahead and apply a multiply blending mode to that, uh, to that image, okay? Notice that we have much richer contrasts in the shadows of the image, okay? Well, what do you do if those contrast is maybe, or if the contrasts in the image are too extreme? Well, if you look over to the right of the blending mode, you're gonna notice that you have an opacity slider. So by clicking on the opacity slider, that allows you to adjust the overall effect of that blending mode. So you will most frequently actually probably notice that the blending mode you know, does too much. Okay, it's, you know, it's too extreme. Uh, maybe the image becomes too dark or becomes too washed out. Okay, so you can adjust that opacity slider to kind of reduce the overall effect. Uh, let's take it a step further. Let's say you apply the blending mode and um, it's not enough. Okay, what, what might you do to maybe increase it even more? And you can't apply, you can, unfortunately you cannot apply the blending mode twice to one layer. What might, and what might you do if, if, it's, uh, if it doesn't do enough to your image? You want more of an effect. Anybody have a guess? Use one of our last assignments things. You, you, uh, burn. Sure. You burn. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. But uh, an easier, quicker way is you can actually duplicate that layer again. So you can now create another multiply layer that you could put it on top. So you're just adding to the effect, okay? So you will frequently notice times where it's either not enough or uh, it's too much, okay? Very rarely do you click on it and it's like, wow, bingo, perfect, I'm done. So uh, you know, your first option is to use the opacity slider. So starting over at 100%, uh, I'd say it's a little too dark. The goal when you are deciding, uh, you know, looking back at that question we asked earlier is how do you know when it's actually complete? Uh, myself, when I look at this, I have a little bit more detail on my screen, so it actually, it's a little bit hard to explain on the on the projector, but one thing that I lost at 100% is that the dark areas under in these little crevices of the train are so dark that you can't even see any of the detail in there whatsoever. So, uh, m m what you might want to do is reduce that opacity so that you can start to get you can start to see some of those little details in the areas where there are really dark shadows. Okay, you don't want them to be so dark that uh, you can't notice any of that, uh, you know, any of the details in those shadowed areas. So reduce it just enough that you can start to see that. Okay, so maybe it's about 65, 70% or so. Looks good on my, on my uh, pretty good on my screen. It yeah, actually looks really good. So let's look at the difference between the before and the, and the after. So that's the before, you can see that the background is very washed out, very white, very washed out and uh, our shadows 
are, uh, are kind of dull. Okay, so we turn on that multiply layer, you can see that that becomes, all the shadows become a lot richer and uh, the whites in the background actually have uh, hardly any change at all. So little to no change at all. All right, so before and after. So that's an example of the multiply blending mode. So really quickly, we can just look at uh, what, what would happen if we applied one of our other ones. We turn this back to 100% and let's apply a screen layer. You can see that the screen layer had a very opposite effect. I would not say you know that's desirable. Ultimately, when I asked myself the original question is what is the problem with this photograph, I've now actually made the problem worse than kind of what I was originally looking at. Uh, let's apply an overlay. And an overlay actually works really good too. In fact, I might even say that's even a little bit more desirable than the multiply blending mode, okay? So notice that uh, when you apply the overlay, our background, so our background that's kind of smuggy, so you can kind of see the haziness of the background here uh, behind the train. When I apply the overlay blending mode, a lot of that actually goes away, okay? So it actually allows the train to pop a little bit more. But we also get some nice uh, increased saturation in the shadows, okay? So that works pretty well too. I'd say that's, that's a successful blending mode. So both multiply and overlay, I would say, work, uh, work really well for that example. So let's look at our next one. Let's look at uh, an image that uh, overlay might work really well in. So if we go back to canvas real quick, we're gonna notice that we're going to apply the same sequence of events over to an image to which we're gonna uh, use, uh, sorry, not overlay yet, we're gonna do screen first, okay? So let's go back to my thumb drive. You can either, ideally, you're gonna use the images that you took yourself out on campus, uh, but if you really are not finding one that's working the way that you like, then you can use the Creative Commons and apply those examples to that. So let's look at, let's try this one. Okay, this is actually, this is a good one. This is a good one because uh, if you look at this image right here, what, let's just kind of analyze this image as a class. So this is another old image, but what are some of the problems with it? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Yeah, exactly. But it's still not really white. It's still it's still kind of a, you know, it's it's almost kind of tan. It's kind of a creamy, you know, a creamy color. Well, if I also uh, what are, what's what's another maybe a negative aspect of this photograph? Somebody on this side. Go ahead and give me your best best shot. Yeah, what's another negative aspect of this photograph? So if you look at this and you say, uh, you know, if you were to point out a couple problems, we've already pointed out one with the uh, with the shirt of the boy. What's another kind of downfall of the photograph? I could say like where his socks and his pants are, but it's like can't really see it much. Well, a lot of the problem comes from the aspect of that it's a really old photograph, and a lot of photographs like the one we were just looking at. Uh, can be really dark and smuggy. So in general, the whole image is really dark and kind of smuggy. Looking all the way around, looking at the street. Yeah, uh, you can actually like, notice that the, the pants and the socks are blending in the same color. So you want to like see the... You're talking about these areas right here? Yeah. And up here? Yeah. Yeah. You actually would like to see a little bit more contrast yeah. between, uh, between those items. So let's do the same thing we did earlier. I'm going to duplicate this layer. And I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this a screen. All right. And let's go ahead and apply that. Let's actually start by applying multiply just to kind of see what that effect is. Yeah, terrible. That's not the effect that we're looking for. So remember that the darks are going to become darker and the lights uh, will have uh, no effect at all. So let's, let's uh, go down and use the screen. Okay, so you can see here that the, uh, the, the shirt on the boy has actually become even wider. We actually do have more contrast in a lot of his, in his shorts and his pants and a lot of the other darker portions. But I would say that it's probably a little bit too much. It's probably, you know, it, it's actually washing out just a little bit here in the middle to where 
the boy's shirt is almost the same color as the sidewalk that surrounds him, okay? So what might we do to maybe reduce that effect a little bit? Opacity. Opacity, right, exactly. Ding, 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 ding. All right, so we're gonna use the opacity layer. So maybe we bring this down just a little bit. I'm gonna leave it about right there, about 75%, where I can still get kind of the graininess of the photo. I like that. It is actually an old photograph, and that's part that's you know that's a part of of, of that kind of photograph. But we can actually now see and get more contrast uh, between the sidewalk behind the boy in the boy's shirt. Okay, so let's look at the before and after. So there's the before and the after, and then. Just like he said, actually, a really good thing that he called out is we can actually see a lot of the contrast now between the darker portions of the image. So that's a, a nice, successful example. Let's also try overlay. We'll probably actually notice that overlay probably works pretty well for, for a lot of them. Actually, not, not quite as much for that one. Really dark. Yeah, actually a little too dark. It's actually a little bit too much. Uh, too much saturation of the shadows and of the shirts, or and of the shirt. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Uh, let's look at our next example. We're going to look at overlay, a good example of overlay. So let's look at, let's actually look at a color image this time. I'm gonna pull up an image from last class. Let's look at let's look at this ocean photo. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing. We're going to duplicate the layer. We're gonna hit OK. I'm gonna rename this to overlay. Okay, and I'm gonna click on that upper image and let's go ahead and cycle through a couple of those different blending modes. So we're gonna click on multiply first. You can see here that that gave us nice, really rich shadows in the images, okay? But overall, it's still actually a little too dark, okay? If we go to uh, screen, what might we think would happen in screen? If we apply the screen to this, and it usually has an effect on our really light tones, what do you think might happen to the overall image? It's probably gonna become a little too bright. It's probably gonna be a little washed out. Oh my gosh, actually really washed out. Okay, so that's not a good option either. But if we go down to overlay, you'll notice that it's actually a really nice balance between multiply and screen. We can see that uh, the clouds and the splashes of the waves become really white and bright and they start to pop. But we also get a nice uh, balance of the shadows in, uh, in the waves and in the sand. So that's, that's a good example of using, of using overlay, okay? So let's move on to number four. The next one we're gonna look at is luminosity, okay? When you're using luminosity, um, ideally you're gonna use it on an image that um, already has a lot of really rich tones in it, okay? So lots of reds, oranges, yellows, uh, lots of images that are kind of generally uh, already a little saturated, okay? So this actually would be a good, a good image to do that in. Let me open up another one though. Let's see, luminosity, let's try this one. Okay, so here is uh, an image of a beach, okay? It's dark, it's a nice sunset photo. Notice that we have, uh, you know, nice rich reds, yellows, oranges, we got kind of the browns of the rocks, okay? So what we're going to do to apply the luminosity uh, blending mode. So we're going to start with by doing, actually, take that back, we're not going to duplicate our layer, but we're, what we're actually going to do instead is we're going to go up to layer and we're actually going to apply the blending mode to an adjustment layer. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit different of a process uh, than we did uh, for the original three. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go to layer, we're going to go to new adjustment layer, and then we're going to go down to curves. Okay, so I'm going to call this luminosity. Okay, I'm gonna hit OK. And then the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply a nice S-curve to, uh, to this image. And what that's gonna do is it's actually gonna purposely 
kind of oversaturate the image uh, in both the lights and the darks, okay? So you'll notice that by applying this S curve, I'm gonna place a point right in the middle. I'm gonna place it in the upper two thirds and I'm gonna place a point in the bottom third, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and bring this point up a little bit up here and I'm gonna bring this one a little bit down here, okay? So to where we get a nice, nice S curve. And if you wanna actually maybe just embellish it just a little bit, that's okay, it'll actually have a nice effect when you apply this blending mode, okay? So by doing that, by applying this S curve, <clears throat> we've actually really started to actually oversaturate the image, okay? So from there, clicking on that adjustment layer, I can then go down and apply the, lumin uh, the luminosity blending mode, okay? Notice that it's still retained a lot of those really rich colors that we had from the very beginning, but actually made them really balanced over in the sunset. But we also got a, a really nice balancing effect of all of the, uh, the contours and the details and the rocks and the waves, okay? So let's do the before and after. So we have before, okay, and after. Notice that a lot of our, uh, a lot of our ocean and our rocks in the foreground got nice and rich. The shadows uh, are a lot darker but our sunset is, uh, has a little bit more pop to it, but it's not oversaturated, so it's nice and balanced, all right? So that's gonna be luminosity. That's gonna be the fourth blending mode that we're gonna talk about today. And then lastly, we're going to uh, create what we call a grunge image, okay? So if you go to Canvas and you look at part five, we're gonna be creating a grunge image. And what we're actually gonna do is we're actually gonna overlay two separate images to create a different effect, okay? And we're gonna do this later on in the semester when we actually start to create rendered floor plans. Uh, we're gonna create a floor plan where uh, we don't necessarily have uh, a texture of the ground around our cabin, and we'll actually create one. And this is actually a really good way to do that, okay? So I am going to start by opening up, let me find the appropriate image for this, for this task. Let's see. Okay, those are actually the grunge images that I'm going to use. Let me find kind of an older photograph. Let's see if this is working now. Okay, let's type in. Let's type in. Uh, let's see. Someone give me a place. How about Rome? Let's let's type in Rome. Sorry, I was going to let someone give me the place, and then I thought of the perfect place, and I didn't want someone to give me something like Bakersfield or something because that wouldn't have worked out well. Uh, okay, perfect. This is exactly what I want right here. Let's use let's use this one. So I'm going to click on this image. If it opens up, come on now. Okay, and I'm going to download the original. So I'm going to click on the download button. I'm going to click on download original, and then I'm going to right click on this and open it in Photoshop. So the overall, I'm just watching this tick ever so slowly. The overall goal of this is that I, once I open up the image inside Photoshop, I'm gonna apply a layer on the top of it to actually make the photograph look as if it was on like crumpled parchment, okay? Uh, so let's look at what how that might look. Okay, so here's our original image, all right? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna apply a I'm gonna apply an adjustment layer first to this, all right? I'm gonna just bring up the brightness just a little bit, okay? Just to kind of fix this photograph to a way that I like it. So that looks that looks a little bit a little bit a uh, little bit better, okay? So from here, I'm gonna to go to File Place, and I'm going to click on one of these grunge images that I've downloaded. And since you're not gonna have any grunge images, obviously already on your thumb drive, if you go to uh, Creative Commons and you actually uh, type in grunge image, you'll get a bunch of examples of what that might look like. Okay, these are, uh, these are really good examples right here. So we have a texture, and usually a lot of what a grunge image actually is, it's, you're overlaying a texture over an original image, okay? So for example, here's a nice texture right here. We have something here that might give it the look of maybe some old paper. Okay, here's one that I actually have on my, uh, on my thumb drive already. Okay, so these are a bunch of examples of, of a grunge texture. You might use something like a rock 
uh, as a grunge image. You might use something like soil or ground as a good grunge image. Clouds would actually be a good one too. Okay, so let's take a look on uh, what that actual effect might be on our on our image. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my thumb drive. Fall 2017. Da, da, da. Photo examples, and let's choose. Let's choose. Let's actually try. Let's try a couple of these. Let's try this first one right here. Let's try this one. I'm gonna go to File Place, and that will place the image over on the top of your original image. Okay. Since I'm not concerned about scale or proportions on this, I'm actually just gonna stretch this image to fill my entire screen. Okay. So I completely do not see the image below. Okay. From there. I can go ahead and hit the check button in the upper right hand corner of my screen that will place that image over my original okay and let's start to uh, apply some blending modes to this okay so the first one that I'm going to try is I'm going to try is uh, is multiply okay and this is actually my original intent because if I put this back to normal uh, I'm going to ask myself the question what am I trying to do well what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to retain a lot of the really dark portions of this kind of scratched up paper and I want to apply that texture to the image behind it okay so what that'll do if I apply the multiply blending mode is it will make the lighter portions of that image transparent but I'll retain the darker portions okay so notice that um, I start to I actually keep a lot of that kind of scratchiness like actually kind of reminds me of like an old film reel as you're watching that film and it looks all it's all kind of scratchy and, and blotchy well that's kind of the effect of what I was trying uh, what I was originally trying to get so that would be a good example of a uh, of a blending mode or I'm sorry of a of a grunge texture okay so if you look at let's try screen screen obviously does not work well it is the complete opposite of as what I was originally after uh, overlay actually might not look too bad yeah it looks okay it actually kind of washed out the image behind it because it made the whites uh, in the image actually a little bit brighter but overall I knew that uh, multiply would give me the effect that I was looking for so let's try the next one I'm gonna go ahead and put the crumpled up parchment on top let's try this one right here and place I can go ahead and fill my screen Oops. and I'll click on the check mark and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to apply the multiply blending mode, and we'll notice that um, my background image now looks, you know, even older than it originally did. But I can still get the wrinkles and the effects of the wrinkles in that photograph. Okay, so the photograph, the original photograph, now looks as if maybe it was actually taken back in like the 30s or the 40s. Okay, it actually already kind of had that effect a little bit. So. Uh, if you want to try maybe doing that to a, maybe a, even a newer photograph to make it kind of give it that older older look, that would be a really good way to do it. Maybe try making it black and white so you make it monochromatic and then apply this blending mode on top of that and you might have some really nice effect. Good way to make new photographs look old. Unless you have like a 2016 Mercedes in the image then it's just not going to look old because it's a brand new car. But anyways, this image actually works pretty well. But the, uh, when I applied the blending mode, it's actually still a little too dark. So if I go ahead and adjust the opacity slider, I can actually get it, actually right there looks really nice to where I still got the original coloring of my image, but I still can kind of get those wrinkles from the image that I overlaid it. So that's a good example, uh, another good example of, of a grunge image. Uh, any questions about either of those five uh, blending modes that we talked about? Okay, good. So we'll go ahead and leave it at that. That's gonna be our discussion on blending modes. Um, before we go to break, I just wanna quickly talk about some basic selection tools, okay? And I'm actually gonna kinda of revert back to some of the things that we talked about uh, last class. So let me close this down and let me open up an image from last class. And let's look at a couple different selection tools. <clears throat> Let's try, let's use the Yosemite photo. Open with Photoshop. Actually, eh, that's not really the best image for me. Let me try another one. I'm gonna actually use that ocean photo. Oh, 
Okay, perfect. So let's just say that you maybe you want to apply one type of adjustment layer uh, to a portion of the, maybe to just the sky and maybe uh, the area just above the horizon. And maybe you want to apply a different adjustment layer to the, to the, you know, the, the lower half of the image, okay? Let's look, at a, let's look at a couple of our different selection tools that we're going to learn about this semester. Um, I'm going to talk about two today. One is going to be the quick selection tool and one is going to be the magic wand tool. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly and don't worry, we're actually going to have a whole lecture on uh, these two tools along with a few others as well. But this should help you at least accomplish uh, some basics, uh, you know, kind of easy selections that you might want to use for the first assignment. So the first one we're going to look at is the magic wand tool. Okay, so if you click on the magic wand tool, uh, we're going to have, uh, notice that up here in our upper ribbon, our upper horizontal ribbon, that we have a couple different options. What we're going to focus on is what you see here as tolerance, okay? So if we click on the image, and I'm actually going to unlock this. So I'm going to click create layer from background, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select just the area above the horizon line. So the horizon line uh, be in this area right here. Okay, so everything above the ocean. Because ultimately I'm going to create an adjustment for just the sky and I'm going to create a different adjustment for uh, the ocean below. All right, so if I click on that sky, notice that Photoshop kind of does its best job in trying to interpret what it is that you're trying to select. Okay, well, it actually did a pretty good job. It's not, not bad. It actually, you can see that it stopped it right above uh, the hills in the background, but it didn't quite get uh, the remaining portion of the image, okay? So holding down the uh, shift button, notice that the magic wand, there's a little plus below that, okay? You can see it right there. I would reach a little further, but then I'm gonna let go of it. But notice the little plus below the magic wand. If I hold that down and continue to click in the areas that don't have a selection, so up here, right there, it there and I can just kind of go around and just kind of click on these little areas. Notice that it actually did a pretty darn good job of interpreting exactly the area that I was trying to get. Okay, And if I hold down Alt, I'm going to just zoom in and notice that when I hold down Alt, I get a little minus sign next to my magic wand. Well now I can actually click on the areas that I want to remove from that selection. And you can see there that it actually adjusted it so that it went just above that horizon. What it's looking for when you click down or when you use the magic wand is it's looking for uh, changes in contrast between the image, okay? So you can see here uh, that there's a strong change in contrast between light and dark between the, between the sky and the, and the hills. So it can make that distinction between those different areas of the photograph, okay? So from here, uh, what I can do is I can actually apply an adjustment layer just to the area that I've selected, all right? So there's our first selection. And then I'm going to go over to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. And uh, maybe I want to, let's see, let's adjust. Let's actually do a fun little Let's do a fun little uh, little task here where I'm actually going to change uh, the entire image. Actually, no, I'm gonna do that a little bit later. I was gonna change part of the image to black and white and maybe make uh, you know something else pop. Maybe, for example, if you had like an apple in a photograph and you selected the entire background except for the apple, you can make that background black and white, but not the, not the apple, okay? Uh, I'll actually do an example of that in just a second. But let's say we want to uh, let's say we want to apply. I'm going to apply a a levels adjustment to this. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to balance out the darks in my sky. So I'm going to move my gray or my black slider over just a little bit. Okay, so that I get really nice contrast in my sky. Okay, notice that as I move this slider up and down. Notice that the adjustment is only happening to the area that I had selected, okay? It's not affecting the ocean and the beach below, okay? So I'm going to move that dark slider just so I can get nice rich contrast uh, between my hills and my sky. I'm going to move it about right, about right there, 
Okay, maybe a little bit more. Right there. Right there, I'm starting to get kind of a really dark effect above my above my my hills, so I don't want to go too far. I'm gonna bring it about right about right there. Okay, that looks good. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring that back. Let's look at the difference between the before and the after. So the before was really washed out. The after is, you know, a little bit washed out over here in the corner. That's okay. That's where the sun's going down. That's just the effect of the photograph. But I actually still have some really nice, rich blues now uh, in my sky. So that, that, that's, a, that's a nice effect. Now, I'm going to do the opposite uh, to the area below, okay? But instead, instead of trying to select uh, the area below the horizon, I'm going to do a different approach where I'm actually going to select... Sorry, I'm going to go ahead and do Control D. Control D is deselect. I'm going to click back on my original layer zero, and I'm going to select my sky again. Okay, let me zoom in and deselect this area. Oh, come on, don't be fussy. There we go. Okay, so instead of, all right, I'm not going to fuss with that. I'll go back to that. So instead of trying to select the uh, the waves, which you'll notice that things, objects in your image that have things like hair, things that kind of spray out, will actually be, will, will be pretty challenging to actually select. Although we'll look at some techniques later on at another lecture on how to do that. But now that I've selected the, uh, the sky, I'm going to go up to select and I'm going to click on inverse. So that actually just reverses the selection that I had. So instead of trying to select the hard object, I selected the easy objects, uh, knowing that the hard object was actually just the opposite. So I'm just kind of, uh, I'm just using the, you know, the tools that Photoshop offers. So I'm going to use the, the inverse tool and I can now apply an adjustment layer to, to that area. So adjustments and I'm going to apply uh, I'm going to apply a, uh, a curves, a curves layer, and I'm going to go ahead and create a nice S curve to my ocean. I don't want it to affect my sky. I'll go ahead and hit OK, and uh, that looks nice. Although it didn't apply, actually, let me go back. I did not apply an adjustment layer. I think I applied a just a regular layer. So let's go to curves. Okay, there we go. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. One more time. Okay, so that's what I'm looking for. So let's look at the before and the after. So notice in my layers, notice that I have two thumbnails. Uh, if you look at the thumbnail, the white area is going to be where you actually apply that adjustment layer to and a dark layer is going to be the area that actually remained uh, untouched, okay? So notice that we have the opposite of those two. All right, so let's look at the before and the after. All right, so the before, it's actually a pretty good photograph to start out with. It's not, it's not, it's not too bad. But then I go ahead and apply my different adjustments to it. I get a lot more richness and detail in the clouds, okay, by using the uh, levels adjustment. And I got some really nice, rich color in my sand and my waves by applying the uh, the curves. Okay. So any questions on on that selection tool? Okay. Good. I'm going to do the exact same thing to just to just one of them using our quick selection tool, just so you can get an idea of how it works. They're both going to do the same thing. You're not going to one's not going to do one thing differently, uh, but you'll just pretty much develop a preference uh, between using them. Okay. So let me delete these. Oh, actually, before I go to the quick selection tool, uh, I mentioned the tolerance, okay? When earlier, when we clicked on that magic wand tool, I talked about tolerance, okay? Well, what this allows us to do is it basically increases uh, the sample size of which it's gonna select. So if I make this tolerance, let me just go to the extreme example of 100, and I click on that sky, notice that it just totally goes way beyond our horizon, okay? So what it's doing is actually looking for less contrast uh, difference between the pixels so that it, ha it actually has a much harder time uh, selecting uh, those really fine objects. But if I deselect that and I turn that tolerance way down to something maybe like 
10. This actually allows us to uh, start to really select really fine details in an image. So if I select, uh, for example, above this cloud, notice that instead of actually trying to select a majority of that sky, it actually selects just that little segment be uh, between the clouds, okay? And if I keep increasing that tolerance, it's gonna start to kind of branch out and grab a little bit more, okay? So I'll go, I'll go up a little more, 50. Notice that it grabs even more of the sky, okay? And as we go even more, maybe 75, you know, it then starts to lose that distinction between the sky and the, uh, and the ground below it, all right? So that's gonna be our magic wand tool. Let's move on to our quick selection tool. Uh, very similar to the magic wand, if I, uh, you'll notice that um, like when we, were, when we were using our paintbrush tool last class and we were talking about the difference between size and hardness, you have that same op or opportunity to use that same tool here. Uh, I'm not going to touch it right now, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it as is. But notice that as I hold down my mouse, I can actually start to carefully go through and carefully actually select the areas that I'm trying to uh, select versus just clicking on the screen and kind of hoping that it selects the right thing. You have a little bit more control when using the quick selection tool, all right? So I can go through and I can actually carefully select the areas that I want to choose, okay? That actually grabbed it pretty quickly. And if I hold down Alt and I zoom in, Notice that the area between my circle has the negative sign now. I can then go through and deselect the areas that I don't want in my selection. Okay, so both tools do the same thing. They both will ultimately have the same effect, but you're just kind of getting to that end result in a different way. Okay, any questions about either of those two tools? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. We'll talk about selection tools uh, a lot more actually in, in about a week. Uh, but from there, we'll go ahead and call it, we'll call it quits. And then I think that'll be a good amount of material to do today's exercise and to also complete your assignment one. All right, any questions before we go to break? Good. All right, let's come back at 7.55 and then we'll have used the remainder of the class to work on our exercise and our assignment.